What's up, folks? Welcome back to the Whoop Podcast, where we sit down with top performing people. I'm your host, Will Ahmed, founder and CEO of Whoop. We're on a mission to unlock human performance. If you're thinking about joining Whoop, you can visit whoop.com to sign up for a free 30-day trial. Use those insights to improve your health. On this week's episode, Whoop Global Head of Human Performance, Principal Scientist, the fearless Kristen Holmes, is joined by women's soccer star, Allie Riley. Allie captains the New Zealand national team in Angel City FC. She has represented New Zealand at five FIFA World Cups, four Olympic Games, and will be headed to Paris this summer. In 2023, Allie led the New Zealand national team to the country's first ever World Cup match win. She's also a cookbook author who is committed to using her platform to help create accessibility to healthy food options and advocate for women in sport. Kristen and Allie discuss Allie's state of mind ahead of Paris and what it means to represent New Zealand, advocating for yourself as a student athlete, leadership styles and handling nerves, nutritional habits in Allie's cookbook, social media and connecting with fans. They touch on how it has brought more attention to women's sports and how Whoop has been a key part of Allie's longevity. If you have a question to see answered on the podcast, email us podcastwhoop.com. Call us 508-443-4952. Here are Kristen Holmes and Allie Riley. Allie, Hi. Paris is a few weeks away. What's your state of mind? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I'm trying to stay healthy. Of course, selection is in a few days or in, in about two weeks. So, you know, you never want to take anything for granted. But if I am selected to go, it will definitely be my last. I cannot, I cannot continue um, another cycle, but I think it would be such a special way to kind of round out what has been such a, an unexpected and amazing and overwhelming career with the New Zealand national team. And um, I really, really hope I'm on that plane and get to represent my team probably I mean- for one of the last times at that, at that level. And yeah, I think after hosting the World Cup last year, to have another opportunity to make history, to just have another opportunity to represent the country that means so much to me, even though I obviously wasn't born there, don't have the accent. But yeah, I really, really hope I'm doing everything I can so that I could be selected for for the Olympics. I mean, this is going to be your fifth Olympic Games. Yes. And you participated in five <laughs> World Cups. What did you did you make the team when you were ten? Like, how is this even possible? <laughs> I'm turning 37, so I wasn't well, that young compared to some of these amazing phenoms that are coming out on this world stage at such a young age. But um, yeah, I just my senior year of high school, I mm-hmm. started my my dad sent a DVD to the the coach of the the youth. New Zealand national team got called in, had never met anyone, just flew to Australia for a few games to try out. I still, I can't believe I was brave enough to do that. But the next year was the, the women's world cup 2007 in China. And, you know, I couldn't say no to that. So it has been, it has been a long, a long journey, but yeah, I, it's, it's been amazing. It's it's really hard to reflect on it and not get emotional, especially with with the World Cup in New Zealand last year. Yeah, well, I can't wait to talk more about that. I, I, you know, I when I consider just, you know, knowing you know kind of the the mental, physical, and emotional toll, just one cycle takes. <laughs> you know, like I, it just it just I can't. When I was reading your bio and I was learning more about you, I just I was like, does this is like superhuman to 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 be able to endure and stay healthy and and be able to to be available for this length of time is is really a testament to thank you you know your preparation and your you know how you're caring for your body and so i, I can't wait to learn more about the things that you do you know because this is really a case study uh, <laughs> worth dissecting so you have dual citizenship yes. so you're both american yes. and and, and a new and yes. a kiwi I also played in Sweden for about eight years. So I also have my Swedish citizenship. So not that I can play for the national team, but it's really cool since my fiance is from Sweden. So we can spend time there and maybe one day return there. So yeah, I feel like Jason Bourne, like with my passports. Totally. So what made you decide? I mean, I feel, you know, as an American, I'm like, why aren't you playing on the U.S. national team? (laughs) So (laughs) um, how did you, you know, what, what made your dad 
decide, did he send a DVD to the US? I want to no, make them I, regret that they didn't. <laughs> I, I never had the opportunity to play for the US. Obviously, I have citizenship, but I was never yeah. called in. I never did ODP. I'm not even sure. I think the club system is so different now, but I never did mm. any development, national team, nothing at the youth level. I got recruited to Stanford, but it was a very kind of, you might not play, I kind of at the bottom of the list type situation and just worked my butt off. And so, yeah, my dad read some article that New Zealand was going to start investing in their in their senior team and in, in an under-20 team because this was the first under-20 World Cup. There, had, there was youth international tournaments, but this was the first under-20 Women's World Cup in 2006 in Russia. And so that that was kind of how it started because there was no I was never going to play for the US. I never that was never kind of on my radar or anything. And then of course once I played for the under 20s and started playing at Stanford, I guess there could have been a moment there where a coach could have said like, "Hey, but I think I completely understand some players maybe waiting and and hoping and and working towards the US national team, you know, the mm. best team in the world, but I'm not the kind of person who would say no to playing at a no. World Cup. So in 2007, I, you know, kind of started that journey and 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 couldn't look back and and have never looked back. It's like been amazing to see the development from going to that World Cup in 2007 and just like being happy to be there to then hosting a World Cup and being like no and making history and hopefully setting up the next generations to do even better at the at the next tournaments. I mean, that is, that's incredible. You know, it, why, why do you think football slash soccer in, in New Zealand was just not as, not as popular? It's just that, is it because rugby and field hockey, you know, some of these other sports are just more resourced? Yeah, definitely. I think rugby is obviously the, the sport and then cricket and rugby for women now has become really popular. The team mm -hmm. won their, their home world cup as well. And I think being a small country and being isolated, it is, of course, soccer is, is the world sport, the global sport, but it is, it is hard if you're not growing up seeing it and you don't have kind of those nearby countries and those rivalries. Of course, Australia was a team that we kind of could hang with the first few years I was playing, but they really have then gotten the investment and the growth and, and you're seeing the return now. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's something I think I don't feel the investment is quite there yet. Um, it's something that I hope the World Cup would change. And it, you have to change a mindset. I mean, yeah. I'm, you're seeing it even in the U.S. with a team that has won multiple World Cups, but only this league has been able to survive more than three years. So it's about the fans. It's about engagement. And for me, it's really about investment. And so... Now, I think, I hope that we've proved a point with the attendance records that were set at, at the World Cup, but it is, uh, it, it is hard to compete with those other sports. And I think, of course, you will know a lot of times when you look at sports, it's the men. The men set the tone. People follow men's sports. Sports is a male-dominated industry, and our men's soccer team isn't a top team, hasn't had a lot of success, hasn't qualified for the last World Cup. So again, if it's about a mindset, but society, if you're like, oh, sports, men, rugby, cricket, whatever, yeah. like you might not be like soccer and the prize money, FIFA, for qualifying for a World Cup for the men, it's a ton of money. It can be, you know, game changing for the federation, for the nation, whereas the prize money for the women, we're fighting, we're barely at 30% of what the men get. So qualifying for a World Cup, if your men aren't doing it, you're not getting the money and the investment, yeah. even from FIFA, our own global body. So it's like, yeah, you can think about it from the bottom up, you can think it from the top down. But yeah, yes, we need to shift things, I think, globally, but also hopefully, and we've been a part of this now as the football ferns, we've got to shift something in New Zealand as well. And we, we, as the players are really trying to do that. The players who've come before us and not experienced the success we have or been able to play professionally, it's really changing. I hope. Yeah. You know, I think for, for some athletes, you know, they really take that support for granted, you know, that the, how well resourced they are. And, you know, you've really had to 
fight, you know, and, and this has not been a short fight. This is a really long fight that, oh, yeah, that you battled. So and just at the beginning of it. I know, truly. Yeah. Obviously when you were younger, you were, you were playing on the national team. You were also competing at Stanford. So you were doing, you know, how, how was that to balance, you know, being a student athlete at Stanford is not trivial. Like it's a lot of work. And presumably you were also, you know, flying to New Zealand and, and taking part in training trips and various tournaments. Talk a little bit about how you balanced all of that and what kind of challenges did you face? It was really, really hard. And from so what hard. I've heard <laughs> from players in the league now, it has changed a lot in terms of teachers understanding. And I think sport, of course, with the shift in probably social media has a, had a huge impact, but mm. I think just being able to see especially women's sports too, more on TV. And there's this understanding, there's a future, there's opportunity, especially for women now. Um, and so I think teachers and academic institutions, even in high school, you know, we have Alyssa and Giselle Thompson, both were still in high school when they came to play for Angel City and they're playing for the national team. There's been a shift to support these young athletes, just like you're yeah. supporting them in their academic ende endeavors. So with the athletics, I think this was quite a while ago now when I was doing it. And of course I had really understanding professors, but it was, it was, and, and even some of my New Zealand teammates really experienced like, you cannot miss this final. And it's like, well, I really want to represent my country on the world stage and, and be able to be available for selection for a world cup, for an Olympic games. Like, yes, yeah, students are still going through it right now, but I think, yeah, the travel, yeah, just when you're at that age, your body is is growing, is changing, is developing. You have different gym programs or different philosophies in terms of recovery. Like at Stanford, we're lifting super heavy and really into ice baths where, you know, I played professionally in Sweden. There's not a lot of ice as a recovery method. Then, you know, you go pro and it's, and as you get older, how you're lifting, it's very, very different. I have to maintain, I can't, we're not doing Olympic lifting, you know? So I think all of that as a young person, all of those different influences you're getting, yeah, different information, and a lot of it can all be based on science, but there can be complete opposite viewpoints. And so I think, and and again, my my love for the whoop, and this is like, you know, I'm not sponsored. This is like something that I just <laughs> love. It's like my best friend. These these kind of support systems, I think, have helped me understand my body. And you talk about having a long career. I think we can talk about successful careers right now in sports until we're making the type of money that the men do. Successful career could be having a short, hot, you make a shit ton of money, but you can't have the longevity because you don't know how to take care of your body and you're not getting right. the right information. Or, yeah, I'm never going to earn over 10 years. I'm not going to earn the amount of money that mm -hmm. some of my colleagues in the NWSL are earning now. Right. But having a long career and experience, what I've experienced, I also have to view that as success. Mm -hmm. I've done what I love for so many years. And so I think comparing how I was as a teenager and in my early 20s to how I am now and how much I know about my body and I can make mm -hmm. decisions, I think that is what is so different from being in a college environment and being young. And, and you kind of mm -hmm. feel like you have to do what people tell you. Yeah, it's so empowering. I, you know, I work a ton with um, Florida State University soccer. And, you know, I think you raise a really important point that there needs to be this triangulation between, you know, your your university coach, the high performance team at the university, and the national team staff, right, and the individual, right, player. So, you know, and and I think, you know, and, and that's, I think, the the benefit of, of these data, you know, is like, we don't have to really guess how an athlete is adapting to travel. Like we, I mean, we're literally using the data when they're going from, you know, Tallahassee, Florida to Dublin, Ireland, you know, we're giving them some grace period to adjust to the new time zone. And we're using the data to kind of help us understand how they're adapting to the new time zone. And when are they actually ready to train versus when do they need some more, you know, athletes that might need more time. And so, you know, have they returned to their baseline sleep? Like, you know, it's all of these things that we know are actually going to contribute, potentially could contribute to, you know, an injury or, yeah. you know, or, or certain like diminished performance levels or, you know, just yeah, even the back end of the tournament, all of it. Yeah. mental health, all of that. Right. You know, we're, we're just at such a, I think a, a cool inflection point where, you know, kind of technology is, is really helping guide, I think some of these decisions 
with regard to the athlete. And, and as a result, we're able to keep athletes healthier. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, the fact that athletes now have the, these data and can really hopefully advocate for themselves, you know, in the absence of maybe the infrastructure that we're talking about. And have you had instances where, you know, just across your time where, I mean, it sounds like just getting your finals moved or, you know, you've had to advocate for yourself at so many different points in your career, you know, maybe talk a little bit about just what that process looked like for you and, and, you know, and challenges or, you know, things that you learned, I think, along the way. It is scary as a young person to advocate for yourself Mm. or as someone new to a league, a rookie or, or wherever you are, if you're not kind of at the end of your career, because you feel like you have so much to lose. And it's completely understandable. And looking at what has happened in the NWSL with abusive coaches. I mean, we're talking yeah. about advocating for yourself as, as a human, as a player, as a woman at, at these different levels. And so I think even then taking that down to just the simple saying to your coach, I don't feel good to train. And that that's like, oh, are they going to think I'm weak? Are they now not going to start me? Like there feels like there's so much riding on every type of, if you totally. try to give feedback and it's so scary. And oftentimes we, well, I can tell you I'm an overtrainer. You have to pull me off the field. I'm the first one on the field. I'm the last one on the field. And I think I'm lucky that I have been able to be relatively injury free for a really long time. But I think at the right time, at the right time, I made that adjustment. And the whoop helped me a lot with that, with realizing just because my legs feel good or, and and again, I'm like, is it my mind telling me that my legs feel good? Like now I have data saying my strain was too high. My recovery is low and the jet lag, I could fly all over the world and be completely fine when I was younger. I hit some point, probably around 26, 27, it would knock me completely on my back. And I, I can barely keep my eyes open. I'm out at training. And so now having this data and I can advocate, but be like, it's not just a feeling, you know? And, and of course people, they should listen to your feelings that shouldn't be ignored, but it just gives me confidence to come and be like, I am, when I'm at home and I'm in my own bed and I go to bed at the same time and I'm not jet lagged and I eat the foods I like, I, I'm in the green almost every single day. I know that something is off. I like, and I can let me, I'll try the warm up, but like, let me, you know, and, and now I do think that sports scientists and, and your strength coach, like there is so much more knowledge and understanding, but just as someone who loves training and wants to be involved in everything, it's almost just, I like, am able to tell myself like, no, like you've got to be careful or take a break or take a nap. Like sometimes you can't, if you have a game and you wake up in the red, I'm still playing that game, but I know that I need to, you know, think of my recovery strategies after. And what am I doing during the day? Am I meditating a little bit extra longer, all those things. So I just think information helps along with that gut feeling to give me confidence to advocate for myself. How do you deal with nerves? <laughs> Um, you, you played in some super cool uh, venues yes, and, yes. you know, you've been a part of a lot of firsts, you know, I just, yeah. you know, do you get nervous? I definitely get nervous. And I tell all the little girls and young players that I talk to, I definitely get nervous. Mm. I think what's helped me, which again is, is harder when you're, when you're a young kid, but when it, again, you want to get noticed by, by your high school coach or a college coach. And it feels like there's so much on the line, but I think loving soccer the way I do and thinking about my form of meditation is, is gratitude. And when I go into a game, when I'm like, what the worst thing we always say, like you score an own goal. That's like the worst thing you can think of. Right. Or like cause a penalty, like something like that. Totally. And I'm like, I will still go to training tomorrow. Like I, my parents will still support me. My fiance still loves me. Like my friends, like some of my friends don't watch the games. They don't even care that I'm a soccer player. Like yeah. I will be okay. And I'm still going to love this game. And I know now from making so many mistakes, like I will get over it. No one will remember it. And I mean, there's been some egregious, pretty, some, some big <laughs> moments, but everyone knows like for me, I'm like, if I do my absolute best, that's all I can ask myself. But when I look in the mirror after the game, if I 
gave everything and mm. I made a mistake. Like, and people get that too. Of course, it's going to be written about. There's going to be now a video of it. <laughs> the There'll be a meme. No. Yeah, no. Exactly. No. The people whose opinion really matters, that's who you have to think about. It's your own and it's the people around you who you really, and your coach, of course, but yeah. your support system. And and then I'm always like, I'm nervous because I care and I want to win, but mm. I know I'm going to give a hundred percent every time I step on the field at training in the gym in a game and that's what what gives me strength and calms me down oh, I love that that's such a beautiful perspective and I I think too like I find it I think it's so hard not to attach your self-worth to oh my gosh. outcomes and how you play I mean I I know that, I mean that was the biggest struggle for me as a young athlete like I would just feel like lesser yeah of a human you know and how do you, I mean, it sounds like you've just got such a great perspective around that and, and you've cultivated that over time. What is your leadership style? And, you know, how do you, when you, I'd love to hear like, you know, let's pretend you're talking to a group of 500 young girls, you know, what are, what do you tell them about leadership? My leadership style is absolutely to serve my, my teammates and in this case, my club. And for me, and it's my leadership style, I think came out of my college coach really recognizing that I was not the best player on the field, but because I brought the best out of my teammates, I, in a way, was the best player on the field or one of the most important, I should say. Yeah. And so I think about how can you be a player that the coach has to have on the team, mm. wants to, almost has to have on the field. Of course you have to have skill. Like, and this is, at this level, we're talking about elite athletes, college elite athletes. But I think I want everyone to feel their absolute best, to feel safe, to feel heard, mm. to feel valued. And because this isn't an individual sport, if one person is having a great game, but three or four are feeling, yeah, they're off or not feeling confident. Like chances are you won't win. If players mm -hmm. don't like each other or aren't communicating in a way that each the other teammates respect or can understand or absorb, then mm -hmm. the team won't do well. You really, your best, of course you can win if you have really good players, if people hate each other. But I'd say you're more likely to win if people are feeling good and feel like they're part of something. And so I think how can you be the best player and work really hard and set an example? And of course you want to, that's one part of it is being the mm -hmm. best that you can be and doing everything, everything you can in your control. But how can you lift up the people around you? And if someone needs something, how can you listen? And I think what happens a lot in sports and in locker rooms is kind of that you talk about someone or you talk about mm. – a coach is a little bit different, but instead of talking directly to someone, you either gossip or you complain. Mm. Negativity can be the you know easiest downfall. Complaining mm. is so easy. Being negative is really easy. Mm. Being positive when things are in the shit, that's really hard. Working hard when you don't want to – you know, when you're tired, that's the hard stuff. And so I think being someone that builds relationships with the people around you so that as you can become someone that people trust to say, give me the information, let me help you by guiding you to who you need to give that information to. Mm. Is your teammate really the person you need to complain to? Or is there something that you should tell the coach? Or can I tell the coach for you? Or can mm. I anonymously? Like, And again, this is maybe not at the youth level, but I think just cultivating these skills of how do you, if a teammate needs someone to practice their 1v1s or you see something, what is a way that you can communicate in a way that lifts them up, encourages mm. them. And so I think for me, there are those leaders who drive a standard, who are a little mm. bit tough and those who aren't super vocal, but lead by example. They stick every tackle. They, you know, you can count on them to work their butt off. And I think I'm, I'm a communicator. I'm someone who will try to build a relationship with everyone from, you know, our, 
operations person to our, anyone at the front office to the last player who doesn't make the squad. Like, mm. because I know how important if you want to be successful, every single person is and them being valued is key and having purpose. And your purpose can't always be to start and to get the most time on the field. So yeah. I think my biggest priority is making the people around me feeling valued. I love that. It's it's so hard on teams because, you know, the ego is so powerful. And oh, yeah. when the ego feels threatened, we do really shitty things to one another. Yeah. Right. And and that's and that's I think when you're when you're on a team and and definitely what I, I try to transfer to my daughter is, you know, you, you raise so many good points, like be so good they can't ignore you. You know, like you have to build your competency. Like that is the only path forward when you're on a high performing competitive team. You must build your competency and you just have to that has to be your singular focus, right? And, you know, I think we we often think about, oh, I want to be a leader, I want to be a leader, but you can't wish yourself into that position, right? No, it's just, no. it's, you know, it's it's just people are going to want to gravitate to you when you are proving that every single day you're going to show up and give your best. And I love the second, the other point that you make are around you know, not talking about people behind people's back. Again, that's just a reflection of someone's insecurity, right? But it's funny when I was coaching in college, I was a, a D- Division One head coach for 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 many years, and that was a fireable offense. Like you would get cut from, you kicked off the yeah. team if you were caught talking behind your teammates' back. It's just little things like that are so destructive to your own learning, development, and progress that you know, I, I don't think those, the, the consequences are, are firm enough in environments, you know, like even in a workplace, like, and you know, it's, it's just, there's just zero place for it. It can really create like poison in the locker room yeah. and, yeah. and talking about going out onto a field or the pitch or a court, how are you going to like ask that your teammate basic, I mean, we're sacrificing our bodies when we mm-hmm. go out there every day. Yeah. Are you really going to give everything you have for your teammate if you can't say something you want to say to them to their face? And if you're doing it, other people are probably doing it too. And can you really trust that she mm. is going to have your back and give everything for you? And that yeah. feeling, and I, again, talking about success, some teams are better than others. You know, some someone has to finish last. But if you look at success or what, and that could be depending on the level having a really good freaking experience mm-hmm. in sport. As a young girl, I think that is so important. And yeah. so that also is a version of success if everyone loved each other, worked hard, did mm-hmm. their best, weren't as good as the other team, but actually I'm like, well, I want to play again next year and then next year. And then eventually you might get on a winning team or you don't play sport anymore, but you have the skills and the confidence, body image, all these things that help women in every line of work and every aspect of society. So I just, oh, the more young girls that play sports, the better. Yeah, I completely agree. I love that. We're going to talk a little bit about just your platform and, um, you know, just the content that you're creating that's just bringing more awareness to these topics. So uh, just love your passion and everything that you're putting out in the world. It's uh, so Thanks. valuable. <laughs> I, I have a daughter, so I'm I, I'm like, you have to follow Allie. <laughs> yeah. So um, I just soak in her wisdom. So let's talk a little bit about your professional career. So how are you navigating that? Just obviously playing for the national team. You've got your professional season. What does that cycle look like? Uh, what does a year look like for you, I guess? And just talk a, a little bit about your experience so far and and where the growth has been? Well, when I got drafted out of college, I was playing in, in the league before this that folded and I went mm. over to Europe and it was a very different experience. That's probably a whole nother podcast worth of, of discussion, but so I'm playing I, in, in England for I've Chelsea in, in Sweden, England, and Germany. Wow. And yeah, I learned so much. I, I learned a new language, but just the football, the soccer was so different. And I really pushed myself, I think physically, mm. emotionally, you know, it was the first time I was on a team when I had a serious injury. It was the first time I didn't mm. play, didn't start, didn't get a lot of game time. I think it, it definitely made me a, a better, a better leader experiencing mm. that. But what I missed a lot was 
I think that sense of collective power that when the NWSL came back into the league, you could feel and was, again, there was things going on in the league that was not good in terms of leadership and coaches, but Mm. the voices in this league together are so strong and have pushed so hard to make this league better. And so I think for me, being in this league, being part of now potentially a new CBA negotiation, the first ever CBA was signed at Angel City's inaugural game. Um, Being part of things like that while then traveling. So we have preseason in January and February. The league starts around March and every about month, month and a half, I'll go off with the national team and play friendly games or qualifiers. And then you come back and jump straight into the professional with Angel City. And I think what's so cool for me now being a part of both is I'm learning these lessons, how to lead, how to, how to harness collective voice, connecting with the most impressive, amazing women, (laughs) athletes, people in the NWSL. And we just want to make a difference. And I think as my career now, I have, I have one more year on my contract, 2025, and I'm, I'm definitely thinking about what the next step is, but I, I love being in this league, being at Angel City, which again is, is a club unlike any other and has done incredible things in its first three years. And then being with the national team where we, we are pretty far behind, we're hoping the home world cup more like kickstarts something maybe not to the level as the 99 World Cup final did, but, you know, on a smaller scale. And now we've won soon to be two professional women's teams in New Zealand. That's very new. So I think kind of the lessons I'm learning by and developing as a player with Angel City, being the captain, having relationships with people in leadership in the front office, and then being in New Zealand, being the captain there and being in a very different place in terms of the progress. but bringing ideas and creativity and this is how we've done it here. Could this work in our own way? Culture is a huge, I'm a big culture girl with not just performance culture, but I think especially for New Zealand, being able to use so many of the incredible, the history and the lessons in the unique culture of Maori people in New Zealand and the successful sporting teams we do have from New Zealand. And so all of that together, I just it's a lot. It's tiring. Again, I get very yeah. jet lagged, but I'm just trying to soak it all in. Like it's, it, it won't be, I won't be able to do this for, for that much longer. And so I want to enjoy every minute. And I am dealing with a, a kind of chronic injury right now, but I'm like, how can I make an impact even when I'm not mm-hmm. training or not on the field and leave this league and this game in a better place than it was when I found it? I think that's probably mm-hmm. the legacy most veteran players want want to leave but yeah yeah it's it is really special and i'm so proud how much the league has changed going of course from the league that folded um yeah. to seeing the Alyssa thompsons and trinity yeah. rodmans and sophia smiths and just these amazing players and I, I think you know i'll be when i'm watching them at their fifth World Cup, and I'm going to be like, if I'm still alive, just kidding. And I'll be like, <laughs> I played against them, you know, and no, yeah, yeah. no one will believe me because I'll be 80, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was amazing. I can't get over the longevity piece. Like it just is, it's just wild. Um, how do you, how are they monitoring load right now? Like the, so when you look at your your professional club, club team mm-hmm. and then the New Zealand team, you know, are you using, do they, do they use anything to understand your adaptation to training, like how, how do they actually manage, you know, how do they help you stay safe and healthy? And yeah. And this has been really interesting too, because I've seen this really from like when we didn't even wear GPS to now it's like every environment you have GPS, heart rate monitor. And then now I think what I've noticed in the national team and with Angel City, the like fatigue monitoring, I've never Mm -hmm. done anything like this before, the jump test. Yeah. So we'll go and we'll jump, we'll do groin squeeze. And then mm-hmm. for those of us who have had injuries, whether it's a hip or a calf or whatever mm-hmm. it is, we'll do 
other types of testing. So we have all this data. So we kind of, they know if you're fatigued, if you're a little bit off and then something I know WHOOP is a part of was we're also tracking our menstrual cycles. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think with so much of the research done on men, like to finally have, and I know it'll take a long time, but still just being a part of it is so meaningful and to have data, there's too many injuries and we're not the same as men. We aren't. Um, and so I think that also is something that I hope, you know, and we're thinking about and, and with our nutritionist, mm-hmm. we'll talk about, you know, how your body is feeling at certain, certain phases of your cycle, yeah. but I just hope- And that's just subjectively tracked. So you're just answering questionnaires. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then, and now we're we're tracking our cycle with the uh, tracking our ovulation. So doing our, our pee, peeing on a stick. But yeah, we just track our and every morning your wellness monitoring answering questions and if you are on your period answering questions about your symptoms. So I think it is really really amazing how much it has changed and how much data there is. Which leads me to another part about like owning your data. And this is something that is going to be this next phase with the World Cup Mm -hmm. and and FIFA wanted to have your data. And we we are thinking now a lot about image rights and naming and likeness, but your health data, your personal data, the distance you're running. I mean, this is something that people are going to want to bet on or be able Mm -hmm. to show at a game like this is all these are conversations that have to be happening and I think that's something as as women and we don't make the money as men and something like our personal data we cannot be giving away for free because we are just as important people want to watch us like all of the bullshit is being disproved like we are worthy and people care and it's a really good investment so these are things now it's all changing when we have this data and this technology. Yeah. Yeah. It's well said. It's, uh, it's valuable, you know, oh, yeah. and, uh, and very valuable and you should be reaping the benefits. There's no question about it. What's up folks. If you are enjoying this podcast or if you care about health performance, fitness, you may really enjoy getting a whoop. That's right. You can check out Whoop at Whoop.com. It measures everything around sleep, recovery, strain, and you can now sign up for free for 30 days. So you'll literally get the high-performance wearable in the mail for free. You get to try it for 30 days, see whether you want to be a member, and that is just at Whoop.com. Back to the guests. You mentioned nutrition, so I want to talk uh, a little. Let's talk about your cookbook for a second. How did this? So you, you know, you've been again really long career. You've probably you've seen every kind of nutrition fad and trend (laughs) come and go over the course of your career. (laughs) And you've tried them all, yeah. So what's what's kind of stuck for you? Like where where have you landed? Like what really works for you? So I think I started avoiding dairy on game day. Mm. A long time ago, I just could feel that something with the nerves and something, it's just yeah. not. I, so um, that was kind of one step into more of the plant-based vegetarian or, or dairy-free lifestyle. And I got my health coaching certification from IIN when I was in Sweden. And it was really like, I just want to perform the best, you know. I wasn't thinking about yeah, coaching or inspiring other people or how it could affect the environment. I was just like, I want to be able to run longer, you know, and faster. And I met just such inspirational people in this course. And I think now it's been really cool to share my way of eating or just how I found, like you have to experiment and you, Mm. the most important thing is you have to fuel. It's something that I really want especially young girls to understand. If you want to be able to put your body through the ringer, which is what we're doing, you have to fuel your body and you have to sleep. But I think where I've kind of landed after trying so many things is for me, um, the environment and animals, I don't eat a lot of animal products. It's personal choice and I feel really good from it. But I have found that two things culturally like being chinese and my my grandparents have passed but the thing that 
always reminds me of them and import, like very big in Chinese cooking is dim sum and cha siu bao, mm-hmm. which is barbecue pork buns, is like one of the things that brings me so much joy. A pavlova is my favorite dessert and that is made with egg whites um, and that is New Zealand's national dessert. And so these are things where I'm like, when I talk about nutrition, I'm like, you can be open-minded and you're always going to get people yeah. saying you should do this or this or how can you call yourself this if you do like feeling good and doing good and like I'm like if you feel good and you're going to do good things for other people and like put positive energy out there like that also is really important and really and really valuable so I think I I still have these things that make me feel so good and connect me to my heritage mm-hmm. and I also realistically Angel City we have really good options and we have a chef who comes in we get really good catered food on the road or we get money to buy whatever we want to eat. When I'm with the national team and other clubs I've played played for, we don't have those types of resources. Mm. And you're traveling all over the world where I was in Sweden and I I asked for vegetarian and I got fish. Like it, there's just different like perceptions of what each diet is and also availability and I, we spent 3 weeks in New Caledonia and my teammate is vegan and she just ate tomato soup. And I'm like, I respect you. I respect you so much like that you stick to your beliefs, but I, I, I need to be able to go <laughs> tackle that bitch out there. So I yeah. think that's one thing that people don't always realize when, and I'm not saying that eating healthy or clean or whatever you want to call it has to always be expensive, but it's just access. Mm-hmm. And I think your time. It takes time. If you don't want to eat the airplane food, you're going to have to cook your own food. And I think male athletes have so much more, so many more resources. The clubs they play for have a lot different, and I'm not saying there's way more vegan male athletes than not, but they're, you know, different dietary restrictions and just, it's just different for women in sports. And we're not at that point Mm -hmm. yet where every player or every club or national team has a chef. So yeah. I think when I cook for myself, I am 80% vegetarian. I do. I do love cheese. Um, but I think <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's something that I've just experimented with and yeah, will maybe change a little bit when I stop playing. But yeah, it's been a huge process, a long journey. Mm. How do you get uh, your protein? What's your main protein source? So, and and this is one of the things that I think is with, with our cookbook, of course. Oh yeah. And so, sorry, one of my best friends, she's vegan and we wrote the cookbook together. And so we have, we have a lot of tofu, you know, she, she likes tempeh. We'll dabble in the, in the, I hate calling them like the fake meats, but like, and a, a beyond beef, whatever. Yeah. But the reality is for me with the amount of exercise, like I, I have protein shakes yeah. and that's, and I'm really, really fortunate that I'm sponsored by Ascent and they have, they have whey, they have vegan protein. And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing a shake to get 30 grams of protein at breakfast. That's not super common um, for everybody. And you have to really think about it. And I think that's too like plant-based versus vegetarian and like eating eggs. There's just so like, and you have to put a lot of thought into weighing up. Do I want to be avoiding this? Is this going to be so easy for me so I can get up, go do what I want to do? But I think that has been, and working with the nutritionist is really, really helpful, which again, is a luxury still. So yeah, I think for me, I go between tofu, a plant-based meat, and then I'll supplement with protein powder. Nice. How do you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned sleep being kind of the other core pillar. Uh, Talk a little bit about, you know, I'd be so curious, like how you think about your whoop data on just a more granular level. Like how much do you actually pay attention to, you know, your recovery and heart rate variability and resting heart rate? And do you have any kind of non-negotiables? I think when you're in like a, a, you know, a, a training you know, evolution where, you know, it's very consequential, like are, are you yeah. f- specific things that you're really d- dialed in on and focused on? 
Absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. I am not exaggerating when I say the Whoop is my best friend. Some people are probably offended when I say that, but <laughs> I the recovery for me is just number one. And I think I've used that because I thought it was so, it was only based on sleep. And that Mm. is a key for me. I need between eight and nine hours and people are like, oh my gosh, that's so much. I'm like, no, I need that. And I have Mm. had the whoop now for like, I don't know, eight years. And I know that I need between eight and nine hours. And then I think the stress, like, so I'll always see with my heart rate variability and, and like, I thought, in terms of like fitness gains, I'm like, I'll keep working, I'll keep working. And I'm just seeing this go. And I'm like, how, why is this happening? I'll have a few days off, not do anything, sleep, no stress, boom. And it's like (laughs) gone up from where it was the baseline. Like, so I think I've just really, really the, the breathing, not being on my phone before bed. Like I've done Mm -hmm. all this with the journal and tracked so many things. One of the interesting things that I realized that when I would report like being a little bit sore or yeah, or if I know, you know, like I've had an injury or like I'm tired, I take so much more care of myself because I was like, how am I having positive numbers when I have a, when I'm reporting something negative. And then I'm like, I am just, I do all of the things to make sure that I feel good and I see friends and I go to bed early Mm -hmm. blah, blah. The one thing I cannot, I do occasionally, but like cannot, I can't drink alcohol. It doesn't matter. Like I, it just ruins me. It ruins me. And like, I think that's too, like, the socialization part of it, I love, but I don't have to do that with alcohol. Like I can have, and there's so many fun mocktails and stuff now. Of course I will still drink sometimes and I'm getting married soon and I plan on getting plastered, but I just know (laughs) every time it doesn't matter. Always in the red. (laughs) Yeah. I know you are not alone to, you know, just so (laughs) everyone is the same. There is not, I've never seen really a human, uh, certainly in our data, you know, if you drink alcohol, the there is going to be consequence, um, yeah. and it's going to. It's worth it, but I just sometimes know. it's absolutely worth it. There's no question. I just yeah, know. I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I think it's probably overall a, a decent thing that folks in general on the Whoop platform are drinking less alcohol is probably a, a good thing. You're super active on social media. I'd I'd love to hear just how you balance that. I mean, it's it's part of your business, right? So what are you, yeah. How do you use that platform? How do you leverage it? How do you stay healthy in inside that environment? Cause I know it can just get, it's the wild west a little bit. So yeah, I would just love to hear your general philosophy on, on how you think about social media and how you're leveraging it. There's so much there because Mm. I have seen, and of course data shows that some of the stuff out there and especially for women, it is, yeah. uh, it's horrible. Yeah, it's um, good. On the other side, I think connecting with people and, and that's part of it. I'm like, I want to balance out all of this horrible stuff and the trolls and things that make people feel like they aren't good enough or they don't look mm-hmm. a certain way. Like I am just my complete self, my family, my fiance, like we put it all out there And yeah, so one of it is to try to bring joy to people and make people laugh and counteract some of the awful things Mm -hmm. and to be real about what my life is like and what's like playing for Angel City in New Zealand and and the things I do, um, which people seem to want to know and and enjoy (laughs) to watch. Um, And then then there's that that piece of, I want to draw people to the sport and I want to tell the stories. That's why I did off the ball with just women sports. That's why I did Allie in LA. Now I'm doing BFFR with, with Sid, my teammate. And I just think it's, it is so fun besides the game itself and people who watch women's sports are, it's, it's different than, than the men's sports audience and it's different demographics. And I just think that people really, they're, consuming more than just the sport. They want to know more about us and our lives and things around the game. And I think it's really, really cool. And so I think that connection piece 
to encourage I mean, part of it is a reminder, like we are human and we're not just entertainers for you Mm -hmm. to just say whatever you want about us. But um, I think that piece in terms of helping grow the game and grow engagement and get people more interested and who knows, someone might be like, oh, I saw that. I was thinking of going to Angel City Team or she had mentioned that like, oh yeah, I just saw it like, you know, and you never know how it can kind of like connect in people's heads. Um, and, And the other piece, and we talk a lot about inspiring people, connecting people, but The other piece that we don't talk about enough is we need the money. Like I need the money. Like this is (laughs) a huge part. And I think what I am proud of is like, I've built this platform and this following like super organically. And then now I'm like, well, yeah, now I have this following and I can show businesses and companies like, yeah, like if like, I have something that if I am using your product or showing it, like you should pay me for because like people look at what I do and like, I think I'm, and I, I am privileged to be able to choose who I work with. And that is absolutely a privilege. Like I don't want to, again, like when I say I need the money, I know there are people who need the money a lot more. And it's really important to me to be authentic and to like promote things that I genuinely use. And not everyone has that luxury. Yeah, I just think some businesses that, and I would try to work with companies before when I didn't have as many followers, but I was doing the exact same thing that I'm doing now. And they're like, oh, you don't have a hundred thousand followers or like, but if we're going to do this, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, gosh, like having an Olympian or being able to say like you and work with me to like, you have a world cup athlete or an elite professional athlete, like using your product, like is there not some way that like this is valuable to you? But it is, it's still hard. And of course we have a smaller piece of the pie than the men. And so then all of us are fighting for that piece. And I want ideally that piece to get bigger and it is growing. More brands are realizing that is good and like not just important, but it is good for their business to invest in women. But yeah, I think that is, of course, a huge, a huge part of it. And so for me to have all those pieces connected together, I put so much time and energy and love wow. into everything that I put on the internet because it is wow. important to me. That's amazing. Was Ali in LA something that you pitched or yes, how, did that, yes. how did that come about? Oh, I mean, I love my club and it feels like it is me and I am it. And I love my teammates and the people around us. And just, there are so many great people who are doing kind of like the hard hitting interviews and talking about how hard it is being a woman in sports and, Mm. and fighting. And, and I talk about those things too, but I love also being able to have like an on the go unhinged in a unique environment chat, Q&A, whatever, like with people I love and admire and have a relationship with. And I just, I can ask different questions and do different things than a journalist or a reporter totally. whoever would be able to do. And well, you so, have the trust. You're on I the do, inside. Do, you have I context. <laughs> like it's the perfect confluence so, of just, um, yeah, entertaining yeah, so content. I, I pitched it to um, Jen Pransky, who's our, our head of media and content. And she also, you know, has mentored me and that was part of the deal. You know, we got Klarna on as a sponsor, which was important, but for her to, it is something I want to do with my life. That's the next chapter, something yeah. I don't know specifically yet, but to be in front of camera and asking questions and it was fun doing it with, with Tish all in the the golfer because we hadn't really you know, with my teammates a little bit easier, but I need to get out of my comfort zone. And so when we were golfing together and, and having a good time, it was, it was really cool. So yeah, I think this is now we've kind of, I've turned left a little bit with Sid and we're doing an even more crazy unhinged show now, but it's just, (laughs) it's so fun. And I, it's content that I think is unique and still does the thing, still inspires, still uplifts, empowers, but we are just really being ourselves. And yeah, of course we want to inspire young girls and motivate, and we have that side of it, but we also love speaking to adults and talking about adult things. And 
yeah, just able to really, really be our authentic selves. And that's something that I want everyone to feel like they can do and be, especially in sport. And sport is has historically and is still a pretty exclusive and a hard place for a lot of people. So I think anytime you can put content out where you're like, it's just cool to be exactly who you are and and that we're doing it, I hope that it still can inspire a lot of people. What's your favorite platform? TikTok? Definitely Instagram. Instagram. I'm too old for TikTok. Like I'm okay. trying, but it, yeah, but I feel like I'm too young now for Facebook. Like that's where my, yeah. my mom is like, oh, I sent someone a fan. Like, or if she sent me one, I'm like, I won't, I yeah. won't see it. But I don't know anything about Facebook, but I did connect with you on LinkedIn. So hopefully you accept my invitation. <laughs> LinkedIn is like, I need to start like- I need You need to, to transition over. I know, yeah. I know. I have gotten that <laughs> advice many times now. Um, I think- yeah, Instagram for me is like the sweet spot and yeah, yeah. it's fun. fun to engage with people. Of course, people can still say whatever they want, but mm, um, yeah, some people are really mean actually. Really, really mean. <laughs> and then like they don't have a profile picture, like they don't really have an account, blah blah blah. But, I, I have like yeah. who are these people? Yeah. I mean, it actually really makes me laugh, but it's you know. wild. It is wild out it there. It is wild. In social media. I feel I feel a lot of I feel really bad. I'm like, God, like this person literally has this kind of time to spend, I you know, know, just being mean. It just seems like that's so, it takes so much energy. I know. But then I'm always like, well, you, you writing on this is actually mm. like, in, it's increasing the engagement numbers. So like, mm, good point. You, you know, yeah, thank so you. Like- <laughs> <laughs> How do you interact with your fans? Is it really in like in direct message or just like in your, in the comments? Like are, are people really active? And how do you how do you manage all that? Yeah, so it it is hard. I think what's cool is that people will watch things and maybe comment, but then I see them at the games. And when people oh. are like, "Oh, I I loved when you did that," and then you know, oh. I, when the opportunity arises, I really try to say like, "I had this interaction with someone, and I have had like the most emotional and rewarding and special like interactions with." fans and and supporters mm. of of the club in New Zealand. I think for BFFR like we said send us your questions. It will take us 10 years to get through the questions, but it's really fun. And for our listeners just explain what what that what that oh, is. Okay, okay. Well, Sid and I wanted to start a show and, and Sid's your teammate. Sid LaRue is my teammate and she is hilarious and she has the two most beautiful children in the entire world and is an incredible mom and athlete, has won, has won everything for the U.S. Women's National Team. She plays for Angel City and she she's just – her content, she's so funny. And so we've kind of joined forces and BFFR is be fucking for real. And so we have just have this kind of like – I don't know if rated R, but definitely PG-13 <laughs> content that we're putting out there and we're totally taking advantage of all of our teammates and and interviewing them and getting them. Our first episode, everyone said their icks about like a potential someone to date. And it was so funny. Yeah. So part of the engaging is like trying to answer people's questions and but for me, it's in person. So I love putting stuff out there that then we can connect with in person at games that is something about the women's game that is very different from the men's game is kind of the access people have to us and how we interact with fans after the game. And that's something that as the game grows and as players earn more money, like I don't want that to change. Like that is one thing. And and not everything we say when we're asking for equity or parity is that we want to be exactly like the men. We want to be treated exactly like, cause we're, we're not, them and like what we have developed in this period of time when we haven't gotten what we deserved or been paid or treated the way we deserve. Like we have developed something really, really special. And there are aspects Mm -hmm. of that that I do want to see continue, even as some other sides you need to like, they need to change entirely. What was your take on the, the women's basketball this, uh, this past year? So Caitlin Clark, Iowa, which is my alma mater, by the way. Well, wow. I mean, what an incredible athlete. And I mean, talking about the the social media losing their minds over her. And I think from seeing where the NCAAs and March Madness, which wasn't allowed to be called that for the women, how that has changed. And again, I always think about this with the trolls and 
everyone commenting on women's basketball about King. I'm like, you're, you, I mean, you're still feeding this amazing yeah. frenzy that we love. And <laughs> totally. The one thing is like, like, unless the players actually don't like each other, like, I don't like to see like people pitted against each other when like yeah. they actually aren't. But I'm like, if they know they're cool, then let these people just, I mean, you will like the money and the attendance and the drama, like people don't even realize like they're helping, they're helping women's sports. And I just think it's really cool. And I think too, like seeing the players who have had platforms and not just speak to, you know, about themselves or the experience, like really talking about the women who paved the way yeah, highlighting voices that may have been marginalized or or hadn't been recognized. I think that's really, really cool. And I think we're seeing more young players do that and you're seeing it in the in the women's basketball space. But I also think part of that, which is like not controversial, but it's like our male allies and how you don't want to be like, we need to be saved by the men, but you're seeing how the men's basketball players who are supporting the Mm. women in not a like charity way, like genuinely because people see them as the tastemakers, as the, Mm. the, you know, the people, the influencers. And so I'm like, when it's done the right way, I mean, Alexis Ohanian, he's, you know, what he's invested in Angel City. He speaks about it on every platform. He genuinely supports women's sports and Angel City. I just think it is very impactful. And so that's watching this kind of all of this unfold the past few years in the, in the basketball space. And of course, soccer is, is different, but it's, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool to follow. And obviously I'm like, come on Stanford. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but no, it, it's great. And yeah. I'm, I'm I really- wondered, I guess I just wonder how much that's going to transfer over to other sports. You know, I feel like just the overall awareness of yeah, I think Women's it is. Athletics is yeah. increasing, you know. I think it's starting to, thing. and that's that whole like sitting courtside. Like now, yeah. at the W games, like you see celebs getting sitting courtside at Angel City. I mean, you like if you spit, it's gonna land on a celebrity. Like it's yeah. just, it's really awesome, and it's mm-hmm. again, it's not a charity. They genuinely want to watch the games, and they genuinely, if they're investing their money, they think it's a good business deal. Yeah, I mean, there's. No question. There's a lot of money. It's very lucrative women's sports and yes. women in general. People don't believe um, it. I think, yeah, no, I think that the data is very clear. So you've had this, you have this very extensive long career. You know, what would be the one or two things that you can point to that has enabled you to really extend your extend your career and thrive? You know, like you're not just surviving, you're thriving. <laughs> it's a difference, right? It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Um I think one part, of course, it is top of mind since we've been speaking about it, is like learning, understanding my body yeah, and advocating for myself like we spoke about. And really, it, it is hard. It's hard to admit or acknowledge or, you know, that your body changes and you can't like, I can still hit top speeds, but can I be doing it every day and still want to be available mm-hmm. on the weekend or be a able to play in a year's time and that lifting has to be different. And it's, it's very confronting to yourself. Like it is really, really hard. And now with this chronic and I like the sciatic piriformis issue and it's just like, Mm. yeah, not training every day or not being in every drill, every part of the session. Like that's, that is really, really hard, but I think really being in tune with my body, how much sleep I need, what type of food fuels me the best and makes me feel good, how much water I need to drink, all of those things. That has been a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. I think the other part has definitely been the way the game has changed because if I was still making the money that I made year one or if we were still living with host families or, you know, if I didn't have – the, the sponsors that are paying me so that I can afford a car because I need a car in Los Angeles. I didn't need one in Sweden or in Munich, but like I, or in London, like those kind of things, I, I wouldn't be playing anymore. Maybe not because I physically would be unable to, but because I financially or emotionally, mentally would not have been able to. 
and my fiance has moved here from Sweden and I'm supporting us. And I mean, these are all things that players in this league, players around the world, whatever sport are facing. And without the growth of the game and individual sponsorships or like leagues growing and developing, like players have to retire so much earlier, not having support. If you know, you want to have a kid, like these are all things like I may, I'm getting a little old now, but if I would want to have a kid and come back, I would think that is a realistic opportunity for me. So I'm going to keep playing. And it's just, that was not the case before. So I think those are two huge factors to why I'm still here. (laughs) It's amazing. So you're going to have a final game and that might, yeah. (laughs) what do you think is going to be in your mind when you hang up your cleats? For the last time. Well, first of all, I hope that that final game like comes by choice in a way. Like I hope it's not that you have an injury and like you can't make it back. And at my age, like signing a new contract is, you know, so that's, I think having a final game and knowing that it's your final game is, is a big privilege. Um, It's something that I hope to be able to experience, but I'm not counting on it. But when I do know that I've had my final game. Honestly, I I think I'm at a point where I'm really excited about what's next. And I feel really lucky to to have come here. And that's how I know it's, it's going to be time soon. Um, And I, I'm so proud of, you know, the, the teammate that I've been, I haven't Mm. achieved everything, every trophy that I wanted, winning a champions league, winning a world cup, winning. And and I look at my colleagues and I'm like, well, they did that. Like, how could I not have, you know, you you always are like, I'm not good enough. But I think I, I just will celebrate the journey that I have had, the games that I have won and the games that I have lost and the people that I've met and hopefully all the people that I've impacted in a positive way. And I think that will end in terms of how I do that on the soccer field and maybe get the kind of weekly airtime of doing something on a field. But I hope and will be even more motivated, I think, to be able to continue the parts that I loved and can still do, which I really can in terms of making people happy and inspiring people and connecting with people and inspiring young girls and making money, hopefully (laughs) making more money than playing soccer. Probably. I think, yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy and I'll probably be really tired. So I'll be ready for a vacation, but no, I mean, there's so many people that I'll be like so grateful for that helped me start, maintain, finish my career. But yeah, I, I still want to be involved in the game and there'll be times I think, well, I'm like, Oh, well, I want to be out there, but I think still, talking about the game and the stories and seeing players do things that I never, ever could have done, could do now then, but knowing that I was a part of it, you know? So I, yeah, it's just, again, that game, that final game could be any, like for any of us, 36, 18, yeah. like your last game could be at any time. I think that's something, what I'm most proud of is probably that that has been my mindset the entire time. Mm. I went to Stanford Because I knew I might not play, but where will I be happy? Whether Mm. I get injured, don't get game time. And I think that's how I've approached every game, every club team, every practice. Like, and I'm, I'm, that's probably what I'm most proud of. It's amazing. Well, we're so grateful that you've shared your beautiful (laughs) perspective with us and with our (laughs) listeners. And it's just, your journey has just been so inspirational and um, yeah, just again, really grateful for all the goodness you put out into the world and you're clearly impacting so many folks and yeah, just we're really lucky. I feel really lucky to kind of learn about your journey and, um, and just this opportunity to talk to you. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for giving me the the platform, literally the Riverside platform. (laughs) Yeah, of course. course. (laughs) Thank you to Allie Riley for joining us on the show today. Best of luck to her and Angel City throughout their NWSL season, as well as the New Zealand national team in Paris. If you enjoyed this episode of the Whoop podcast, please leave a rating or review. Check us out on social at Whoop, at Will Ahmed, at Kristen underscore Holmes 2126. 
Have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us, podcast.whoop.com. Call us, 508-443-4952. If you're thinking about joining Whoop, you can visit whoop.com. Sign up for a free 30-day trial. That's a pretty good deal. It's free. New members can use the code WILL, W-I-L-L, to get a $60 credit on Whoop accessories. That's a wrap, folks. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next week on the Whoop podcast. As always, stay healthy and stay in the green.